Welcome back to the What's Your More podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Harris. And guys, I got to tell you what, this is that time of year where people are getting the right mindset and you know, getting ready for 2024 and great things to come. We had the perfect episode lined up for that last year. If you recall, Dr. Steve Tufts was on our show. It was a fantastic one where he talked about many things from essentially victim mentality to achiever mindset, setting goals, the domino effect, your sphere of influence and how it builds your success and the person you are, being resilient and having a resilient mindset, and then breaking it all down to you are the sum of the five people that you hang out with the most lots of lessons lots of nuggets it was an hour and 14 minute show we went back took all the highlights and condensed it down to 28 minutes to my dear friend dr steve tufts thanks again for this episode and i hope you guys enjoy episode 120 you're a former owner operator of keller williams uh company here at atlantic beach called Atlantic Partners. And uh, you spent a good amount of time there and, and worked your way through a recession into success. Tell us a little bit about that as we get started here. Well, yeah, Qu Quentin, first, thanks for having me. Thrilled to be here and uh, honored to be invited. So yeah, you know, I had an interesting career. I've spent 20 years, 22 years or something like that in corporate America, you know, and reached the corner office of corporate America and decided uh, sometime around 1998 or thereabouts that uh, I was making a lot of money for other people and that I should probably try to apply my skills and all of my energy toward making money for myself, for my own family <laughs> and my own partners. So I went out on my own and owned several companies. And along the way, I ended up uh, kind of entering into the back door of the residential real estate business in Atlanta, actually. And in the third year of having that team, we were the number one team for Keller Williams in the whole state of Georgia, number 27 in the nation. And so Impressive. we did pretty good. Yeah. And I was approached literally in the hallways one time. One of my uh, partners asked me if I had a minute and he pulled me into a conference room and he says to me, you're from Florida, right? I said, yes, I am born in Jacksonville and grew up in Florida. So he asked me if I'd be interested in opening some Keller Williams offices in North Florida. And of course I said, yeah, what do I have to do? And 17 years later, here I am. We now have a pretty decent size operation, and I think we have 11 locations, over 1,200 agents up and down the northeast corner of Florida. So that's how I got in the real estate business, kind of through the back door, but we've we've done okay. Yeah, I would say that's not bad. I would say it's <laughs> not bad at all. And I know there's a bigger history before that, which we're going to get into here. But currently, you're at the University of Florida, and you decided one of the days that my goal is to do the following, and you started going after that later on in life. But I tell you what, it looks like you fit right in over there. Well, when I got my master's degree back in 1980, I thought about going and getting my doctorate and wasn't able to do it, couldn't afford it, and timing wasn't right. Probably my head wasn't right either, but I always was watching for opportunities to go back to school and try to get a doctorate. And I don't know what I was going to do with it, but I just had this compelling desire to have a, a PhD or equivalent. Sometime around, I don't know when it was, 2009 or 2010, I wrote to the University of Florida and inquired about doing a PhD there. And it just didn't happen, of course. It mm -hmm. wasn't the right timing for me. But several years later, 2014, I got an email from the University of Florida that said, hey, we found your name in a file. And we see that you've inquired about doing a PhD. And we just introduced a new program, a doctorate of business administration program. And we're putting together the first cohort. And we'd like to know if you'd like to be in the first, first cohort of our new DBA program. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was, at the time, 61 years old. And so I said to them, what are you going to do with a 61-year-old guy in your program? By the time I graduate, I'll be 64. What are you going to do with, with me? And it turned out that there was a forecast among faculty members that there was going to be a huge shortage of faculty members. In other words, the number of professors retiring far exceeded the number of new PhDs graduating. So there was a shortage of professors. And so I took the bait, and uh, at the sweet age of uh, 61 years old, I went back to college. And I can remember there was a two-week boot camp, kind of a kickoff to the degree, and it was the first class I had to take was statistics. Now, I hadn't been in a statistics class since around 1979, so I was a little <laughs> fearful. But as it turned out, three years later, I walked across the stage, got my doctorate in business administration, and they hired me. Yeah. And I've been teaching at the marketing department, to taught real estate, marketing, some financial classes, entrepreneurship. So I've been doing it. I'm in my sixth year of teaching. When we think about goals, 
we think about uh, almost like New Year's resolutions. I hear you talk about that all the time is that people set goals like New Year's resolutions. I want to do this. I'd like to have that. But they, there's no action plan to get there. What's the difference between a victim mentality and someone that's a, an achiever, someone that's a doer? Before I answer that, let me just give credit where credit's due. You know, most of the things that I talk about are not original thoughts of my own. I've learned them along the way from various mentors I've had. And I'm always sitting in a classroom somewhere or reading a book or listening to something. And so I've just been able to coalesce a lot of the ideas that I've learned over the years into a process that works for me. But back to your point about victim and achiever, I'll tell you a couple things. From a definitional standpoint, in my mind, a victim is something that lets things happen to them or expects things to happen for them on their behalf. And they're always a victim of circumstances Mm -hmm. because they're not controlling their own destiny. Achievers take action. Achievers take accountability and ownership. And when I mean accountability and ownership, I don't mean that they're reporting into somebody and like having a coach or whatever. I mean, they they own the outcome themselves. So that's the real issue. And what I've found is, particularly as it relates to entrepreneurs, there's a very short distance between a dreamer and a doer, a dreamer and an achiever. Let's say you've decided that you're going to start your own business, do something new, and um, you say to somebody, hey, I just uh, started a new business. What you find is that everybody is interested in that. Correct. What's your business? What are you going to do? How'd you get the idea? Tell me more. Tell me more. Wow, that's so cool. You you hear all this stuff. And that's the person you listen to. In that same group, there could be somebody standing in that group and they'll pipe pipe up and say, I got an idea for a business <laughs> and nobody's interested. You're right. Nobody's interested. People are interested in action. People are interested in doers. What I find is that victims don't take action. Victims wait for things to happen for them or on their behalf, almost like an entitlement mentality, like they're entitled to mm-hmm. success and somebody has to give them success or give them opportunity, whereas achievers go out and find it. They seek it. They ask for it. They ask for help. They take action. That's the difference that I see between victims and achievers. And typically victims surround themselves with other victims too. You know, the old adage, show me your friends, I'll show you your future type mentality. Achievers want to be around higher achievers. They want to learn and grow better from other people. That's absolutely true. And it's funny, whenever I um, am around a group of entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs, because I'm a faculty advisor in the Entrepreneurship Center at Mm -hmm. the University of Florida, And it's uh, interesting that the total amount of effort and the total expenditure to take an idea and turn it into a business is about four actions and about $200. Wow. And that's the difference between somebody who's just dreaming about something happening in the future versus a person that takes action and actually makes it happen. Yeah. It's about four, four little actions, takes about an hour or two. And uh, it takes about 200 bucks. Those achievers, they're setting goals. And I love this story you tell about the study that was done about the people that think about goals, like New Year's resolutions. I just said, I want to do this. I want to lose weight. I want to get this car. I want to buy this house versus writing those down versus sharing those with someone. Do you mind elaborating on that just a little bit? Sure. It was a study done by Dr. Gail Matthews out in California, and I'm going to summarize the study. Perfect. She found that over time, people who tend to have their goals loosely assembled in their mind and in only in their mind will attain goals at a level, relatively speaking, at a level of about 43%. So you set 10 goals. Let's say mm-hmm. you set 10 goals, come back a year later, and you've just had them in your mind thinking about them. The study showed that there'll be somewhere around 40, 45% goal attainment. And whereas if someone actually wrote those goals down and had them on paper somewhere, that those people would attain goals at a level closer to 60%, 65%. 17% increase just by writing it down. Yeah, nice big increase just by writing it down. And then the real achievers are the ones that share it with an accountability partner. And they share it in a method where you're going to have a conversation about it on a regular basis 
And this is not an accountability session whereby you feel bad about what you did or didn't do. It's just keeping you on track. Mm -hmm. It's keeping the subject matter of the goals at the top of mind. And those people achieve at a level of closer to 75%. So what happens as I talk to younger people about this, they're afraid to share their goals. So what I always add to that in my teaching is this. It depends on who you ask. Correct. Okay. You can't give your goals to someone who might be in competition with you or someone who might not have your best interest at heart and expect them to encourage you to attain them. Yeah, I wouldn't go ask a competitor to help me achieve my goals. Or maybe you wouldn't ask your big brother or maybe you wouldn't ask your dad or maybe you wouldn't ask your spouse. Uh, Not that they wouldn't all have your best interests in mind, but sometimes they might be judgmental about what you're trying to achieve. The best advice in this category is to pick someone who will encourage you and help you. I've had several times where I've handed my goal sheets to people, even at my age and with what I'm trying to accomplish, and they read it and they go, oh, hey, right down here, goal number four. I know a guy I can introduce you to that could Ah, help you there. There it is. So not only am I getting encouraged, I'm getting assistance. You're getting people to buy into your goals. Correct. And you're getting people to help you because you're sharing it with them. They're like, I can be of assistance. Correct. I can help. Correct. So what I find in general, particularly in younger people who are new to the goal setting process, is this fear of judgment Mm -hmm. causes them to not want to share their goals. And therefore, they don't achieve them. When people set goals, statistics show it's always around New Year's. We're creating some sort of New Year's resolution. You know, that is, the, the media pumps that into people. They've been taught that. It's easy. And so people set goals and they go, this year I'm going to be a homeowner. I'm going to invest in my 401k. But it's a notion without actions. And you do a wonderful job of creating, okay, let's put some action steps into place there. And I love how you talk about this process of one primary goal with three strategies to help obtain that goal. And inside of each strategy, we're going to put five action steps. Because it's easier to keep count of those action steps and go, all right, got this one, got that one. And and you're you're achieving along the way, not just this one ambiguous goal that you want to get to. You want to, can you break that down for us a little bit? Yeah, let's uh, back up a little bit. So what typically happens, there there are two things I'd like to back up to. The first one is that most people will set goals according to the outcomes or the results they want to achieve. What they don't do is they don't back that up to the activities that lead to the outcomes. And so what I encourage people to do is to set goals in terms of outcomes, like Mm -hmm. losing weight or financial achievement or whatever. And then I ask them to back that up into the activities that would drive it. What would you have to do on a daily basis, hourly basis, weekly basis to make that happen? And what most people will do is they'll set a goal like New Year's resolution. I want to lose 20 pounds. But they don't follow that with the daily habits that it would take for them to achieve the weight loss or the daily habits that would help them achieve the financial gain they're looking for. So this process that you're describing talks about both ends of that spectrum. So number one is what's the goal? Mm -hmm. Number two, the second level is what are the strategies that I'm going to use to attain that goal? And number three, within each of those strategies, what are the actionable items that I can take and measure that are going to get me there because it's not what happens is people retain the goal like new year's resolutions they retain the goal they still want to lose the weight what they lose is the activities that they were supposed to be doing on a daily basis that would get them to the goal so they run out of gas they run out of energy they quit about february 15th yep. they're done the backsliding starts mid-february always right the notion of i just want to as if it's going to happen because you said it is is a flawed notion at best but people live by that Yeah, they do. And the other thing that people miss is they miss the conversion. I like to teach and talk about conversion rates. They miss the conversion between the activities and the outcomes. So let me just give you an example. I'll give you a silly example. If you knew that losing a pound of weight meant that you had to have a net burn of 3,500 calories. So now to lose a pound, I have to reduce my caloric intake by 3,500 or I have to increase my burn through exercise or whatever by 3,500 calories. And so now I can convert back to what are the activities I have to do on a daily basis? How far do I have to walk? How many calories do I have to eliminate from my diet? What 
type of cardio exercise do I need to do? So that conversion of 3,500 calories per pound, that's the conversion between the outcome and the activity. And that same type of conversion can be applied anywhere. Quentin, you and I both know in our businesses, which are largely referral-based businesses, Mm -hmm. that in order to get referrals, I have to have a certain top-of-mind position with the people who are going to refer me. And that top of mind position is attained by interacting with these people over time until they realize that we're the best referral destination for them. And so if we knew how many times we had to talk to that person in a year in order to be in top of mind with them so that they would refer to us, Mm -hmm. then we would know exactly how many times we have to talk to people. Yeah. and And it really is that simple, but we tend to miss that mark. And a lot of people tend to miss that. And obviously we're using an extreme example here at 3,500 calories. We understand that, but the notion is that you have to have a metric and you have to understand it in order to achieve it, but you can put actionable measures in place to get there. That's correct. And a lot of people just don't do that because they don't think like that. And they haven't been taught. It's not their fault. They just haven't been taught that yet. And so one of our goals in this podcast is to get people to think about these actionable steps more so than just the goal. Because if you do the actual steps, the goal will help itself. Now, there's something that you brought up numerous times, and this kind of goes bringing it into the one, you know, one thing, as, as we've heard many people in, inside of uh, your organization talk about, mainly because this is Gary Keller's book that he wrote. Mm-hmm. But inside that, he says the domino effect. Correct. And will you speak to that for just a moment to our audience and let them know exactly what this is? This is one of my favorite analogies, by the way. So the domino effect is a a visual in my mind that Mm -hmm. Gary Keller and Jay Papazan, who wrote the book, The One Thing, that they created out of research that they did. It's a wonderful visual. And the science on it is that a domino has the ability, as it topples, to topple a domino of 50% larger area. And this this is scientifically proven. Correct. When you think about that as a visual, it means that if you have a small thing in front of you, but it has the ability to topple something 50% larger then to the extent that you could line these dominoes up in a row so that something small could then topple something 50% larger, which in turn would topple something 50% larger, which in turn would topple 50% larger. And so the domino effect is taking a small action that's well calculated. Then you realize that the small action that I take now, if it's in line with something larger and then subsequently larger and larger, then the compounding effect of 1.5 times 1.5 times 1.5 times 1.5 becomes massive over time, provided you take the first action. If I'm a salesperson, let's just do this real quick. If if you're a salesperson and you want to make seven figures, that might be to the moon for you, right? So let's say seven figures. One actionable step is lead generating. If you can lead generate, just that's all you got to focus. Your whole day is based around lead generating. It's interesting that we've actually seen that domino impact that result. So here's the way to think about that. Okay. If the domino, you got to remember, number one, they have to be close together or they don't topple into one another. Number two, they have to be in a line or they don't topple one another. And so if we use your analogy of lead generating as a salesperson, if you're spending your time hanging out with your buddies, that's not lead generation. Correct. If you're spending your time meeting new people, that's lead generation, and that has the ability to topple another domino. To make the dominoes really fall, you want to hang around with people that have influence. They have influence in circles where you don't have influence. That's a domino that has a compounding effect because it's not just you and one of your buddies. It's you and somebody in a completely different circle that can increase your network and thereby increasing your... amount of potential referrals. Yeah. And so we think about influence. It's an interesting sphere of influence. I think today's world thinks the sphere of influence is, hey, if I can get this person to follow me online, or if this person befriends me online, and they've got 22,000 organic followers, I'm gaining influence. That's one way. But the most effective way is what you're describing right now. And that's sphere of influence. And sphere of influence is something that I think is just, it's, it's a lost talking point that a lot of people are not aware of. And I'd love to take a minute to define that because you said that. So can you talk a little bit about sphere of influence and the importance of that? And actually the study you did on that, I thought was just absolutely incredible that talks about doesn't matter how you look, doesn't matter what you say, that sphere of influence is the only thing that matters. 
Well, it was the subject of my doctoral dissertation, so thanks for giving me the lead in on that. <laughs> there you go. First thing is, I'll say that although we talk about sphere of influence fairly freely in in our world, in the practitioner world, you and I talk about sphere of influence like we talk about having a car out in the parking lot. It's All the time. just part of what we do. Mm-hmm. Because it's so important. In academia, where they do this type of scholarly research, no one had really ever defined or researched sphere of influence. And so I published one of the first papers. It wasn't published in an academic journal, but it was copyrighted by the University of Florida on sphere of influence. And what I did is I did a very straightforward study of the amount of networking that different people had done, realtors primarily, and how their sphere of influence correlated to their sales performance. And the point you're making is that I also added to the study a con- the concept of does personality matter? What I did in the study is I actually assessed personality to see if there was a correlation between people's personality and the results that they were re- achieving, the outcomes they were achieving. No, no real correlation. Interesting. No real correlation. The correlation was this. If they spent their time, regardless of their personality, building their sphere of influence – then that correlated to sales performance in a huge way. So when we define sphere of influence, there were three components of it. The first component is the number of people that you're interacting with. That's the first component. But that's not the only component. The second component is your influence with them. In other words, you could know a lot of people, but nobody. if no one respects you, then you have no influence. Correct. Okay, so second component was your influence over the group. The third component was their influence over others. So Probably the most com- important. Right, because that's the domino effect. Correct. That's Now that's the compounding. If you have influence over them and they have influence over others, then you find this compounding effect taking place and you're growing your business. So today is December 16th. The economy is not in the best position. And we're hearing a lot of negative in the news. There's a lot of negative as to where we're going, a lot of opinions that's going on. And if you listen to our show, we have our opinions of that as well. Mindset is extremely important in these times. And when we talk about mindset, this isn't the first time we've seen some sort of decline in the economy or something that's maybe out of our control, right? And you've gone through some personal journeys with this and you recently shared those with me. Do you mind sharing those with our listeners? Well, I I don't know if I'm a magnet for for (laughs) distressed industries, but yes, I have had four rounds in my life of dealing with a distressed industry starting in the 70s uh, with something that happened with plastic pop bottles at a company I was with and then continuing into the 80s when I worked in the oil field services business and the oil field services business went into the, just into the toilet. And then in the nineties, I was affiliated with the insurance industry when hurricane Andrew blew through Florida and decimated the insurance industry and it went through massive change. And then of course, adding to my experience, I opened my first real estate office in the middle of 2006, right before the global financial crisis, which was of course driven by real estate collapse. Mm -hmm. And so I've been through four of them personally and survived all four of them. And there are some common themes that I've noticed from looking back on these four different, very different distressed industry condition situations. And so there are things that I've seen that, that really have stuck with me. The thing that I have learned is to have the complete opposite mindset that you would think you would have. Most people would say, oh, my gosh, things are so awful out there. By the way, that's a victim mentality. (laughs) Things are so awful out there. I'm just going to wait until things improve. I'm going to wait till interest rates go down. I'm going to wait till inflation subsides. I'm going to wait until Joe Biden's not president. Whatever they say. They're going to wait. I actually have the exact opposite feeling about this, which has allowed me to survive and actually thrive in all four of these times in my life when there's been a distressed situation. And that is, I figure that everybody else is quitting. Everybody else is waiting. Everybody else doesn't know what to do. And so I'm going to take action. And so my mindset is during these times of industry distress, regardless of the industry, I've seen common factors. What I've seen is massive market share shifts. And so you'll see 
For example, in the last real estate crisis we had in 06 through 2009, 10, 12, whenever you want to say it ended, but back in the last one, I remember how many people decided they weren't going to do short sales. Now, without going into detail about short sales, it was a different way of closing transactions. And so you either, you either did it or you were out of business. And I remember how many people would say, I'm not going to participate in short sale real estate transactions. Guess what? They didn't they, sell any, they didn't do any business. Out of, yep, out of the business. Other people said, wow, this is an opportunity for me to learn to do something that nobody knows how to do. And they gained massive market share because they learned how to do short sale transactions. They adapted. They adapted. They adapted. So for me, mindset in these times of distress is about, okay, what opportunity does this create? Because there's an upset to the industry. So the rules are changing. The rules are changing. So what do I do with rules changing? Can I be a quick adapter or am I going to be a laggard and not adapt? Is my mindset going to be, I'm going to, this is my time to gain market share or is my mindset going to be, gosh, times are tough out there. I'm just going to take a break until it gets better. And what I see is the people that have the healthier mindset, even though it's tough, not saying it's not tough, Mm -hmm. but three years from now, five years from now, when things change back to some other positive state of affairs or positive industry conditions, they will have massive market share gains. So what I'm hearing is things will happen out of your control. You didn't cause these economical strifes that happened during that time. However, due to adaptation and due to mindset, you can still be successful. Not can be. You got to do it if you want to be successful. There you go. Not just can be. You have to do it. I'll never forget this. I said in the audience when you told a young man, he was explaining his challenges, his stuff, and you said you need to change your audience. You need to change the people you hang out with. You need to change. And I mean, this was a this was a 26 year old man. You're telling this to. I'll never forget. Two days later, this person moved out of the house he was living in with the people that he identified as the problem based on what you told him. And then I watched what happened to that young man years afterwards as far as career success and how much happier he became. But that was a giant leap of faith. That took a huge amount of just fortitude to do it, and he did it. But I watched you tell him, if you don't do that, that won't change. And darn if he didn't do it. I was shocked. I was, to this date, still shocked he did it. But he did no, no, no quarrels, jumped right out and did it. Parenting 101. <laughs> Watch who your children are hanging out with. Yeah. Yeah. So just – Dylan. Moved forward into the professional world. Watch who your understudies are hanging out with. If they're hanging out with complainers and victims, they will become one. If they're hanging out with high achievers, they will likely become one. Yeah. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Exactly. So, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an honor having you here. I always enjoy hanging out. Uh, usually we're doing this over a beer, but it's too early in the morning to be doing that. But thanks again <laughs> for stopping by to the podcast. Where can people learn more about Steve Tufts and, and maybe find you on uh, online? Well, I have a... A website, it's thetuffsgroup.com. Okay. Just very straightforward, thetuffsgroup.com. They can read my bio and I've got contact information there and links to all the businesses and all the things I'm involved in where they can enroll as a marketing student at the University of Florida, and I'll find them there. How about that? I love it. I love it. Yeah. Hey, for our audience, if you like what you're hearing on the show, rate this podcast, please. Leave some comments at the bottom of the podcast and check us out if you want to see the graphs and some of the images we've talked about on our YouTube channel. Subscribe and also leave comments there for us as well. Steve, thanks again for being on the show. It was great having you today. Yeah, and I hope you'll indulge me if I can just say go Gators as we wrap this up. There you go. Yeah, Absolutely. Quentin, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I got one more shot, I'm gonna make it One more chance, I'm gonna take it I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah